My father was an ordinary man. He was a good father and a grandfather, a husband and a civil servant. At the end of his workday, he came home to a room under our house that was his. And this is where he made things. My father's name was John Ambrose Kenwin Rollins. He was born in Port of Spain in 1940 to an Anglican Catholic family and was in fact baptized twice to appease the various relations, first as an Anglican and then because Granny would have it no other way as a Catholic. It was a kind of simidimi he taught. Daddy had a way of deciding for himself the meaning of things. From the time Daddy was young, he dreamt of becoming a soldier in the army. He was born into a world at war, and his father and godfather were volunteers in the Home Guard. One of his earliest memories was watching them in full battle dress going off to camp in the back of a troop carrier. From what my aunts and uncles have said, it seems he also had a kind of discipline and rigidity, traits that his younger siblings sometimes found difficult to live up to but that he thought would have served him well in the army. For as long as I can remember, Daddy's daily routine included polishing his shoes until he could see his reflection in them, and he would square away the bed he and Mommy slept in so impeccably you could bounce a coin off of it. When he was 12 and in high school, my father joined Fatima's cadet corps. In his autobiography, which he began writing years later and never completed, he said it was the first step in his lifelong ambition of becoming a professional soldier. At 18, Daddy became a company sergeant major in the cadets, and he felt like a god. At last, I was that important man, he wrote. I had just begun shaving and I had a mustache of reasonable size, blocked away with a razor to get the sergeant major effect. Within a couple of years, my father would be a private in training with the British West Indian Regiment posted at Newcastle in Jamaica. When I look at those pictures of him in Jamaica, I get the sense that he felt he'd found his place in the world. He was bright and a sound strategist, but my mother says he found the physical training onerous and wasn't a particularly sociable person. While there, he and two other privates were accepted for officer training at Sandhurst in England, the mecca for men who wanted to become career soldiers. He sent out word of his good news to his friends and family in Trinidad, and congratulations came rolling in by mail. Daddy was preparing to leave for England when he got the shocking news. The offer of training at Sandhurst was being rescinded. His fellow privates, Boxo and Spencer, were to go. But Rollins was to be discharged, his services being no longer required. I looked through some of Daddy's letters and papers after he died. And that's when I really began to understand just how significant a disappointment it was for him, having the rug pulled out from under his would-be Sanders experience. One friend wrote to him at his barracks in Jamaica to say how sorry she was to hear of the bitter blow he'd received and how unfairly he had been treated. She tried to comfort Daddy by reassuring him that what had happened was God's plan. The idea that anything was God's plan probably irritated Daddy more than anything else. But I think he found the Sandhurst rejection a bitter pill to swallow for the rest of his life. He decided that if he couldn't go, he did not want to be in a regiment. 
so he resigned his position before the year was out. And although he would have a fascination with all things military until he died, we all knew that experience changed him in profound and lasting ways. Although he married my mother, and together they raised me and my brother, and in many ways, Daddy was content with his life, being a soldier was his one big dream, and it would remain unfulfilled. For as long as I've known myself, my father was a man who made things. Battleships, dolls' houses, toys, and models. He made everything from scratch, using all kinds of materials. Bristol board, bolts of wood, plywood, sandpaper, thread, wrapping paper, sewing pins, buttons, table mats, odds and ends, bits of jewelry. He'd started making models as a boy, and it became a lifelong hobby, one of the things he loved doing most. When he left the regiment, Daddy went to work for the civil service. He was hardworking and meticulous, but I know he never loved his job. Not the way he loved soldering. He did his job well because that was the right thing to do. But he found contentment in his workshop among his tools and books and models. Maybe making the dockyard an aircraft carrier was a way for Daddy to stay connected to that idea of the life he thought he would have had in the army. I don't know. My father hated idleness and wasn't one for liming with the boys, kicking ball, and getting up to mischief. He spent his spare time at home with us, with a book in his hand or assembling something. He taught me to draw. First he would draw something, and then I would try to copy what he had done. I once asked Daddy to make an elephant pull toy for my cousin. I made a diagram for him to follow, and explained that each elephant had to be a different color. One pink, one blue, and one gray. A few days later, he gave me back what he'd made. Two elephants painted tan. Only a drunk would see a pink elephant, he said. Elephants aren't blue. Now take that and go. And that was the end of that. That man could be inflexible. Daddy was the kind of person who could spend months and months making something. I don't have that kind of patience. Yet, when I was growing up, it didn't seem like Daddy was doing anything special. To me, the fact that he made such intricate models was not extraordinary. It was what he did. But now I feel a kind of pride to take friends to see his workshop and all the precious things he made. My father died suddenly in 2006. I'm an artist now. I don't make models, but I make other things. I think he would have been proud of what I do. He mightn't have understood a lot of it, but he would have been proud all the same.